Alrighty, so about two months ago I made a video on healing in League of Legends and said I would talk about shielding next. But that was a lie, because I made the mobility one instead since I thought that would be more interesting to talk about. But it's been two months, so let's finally get to working on shields in League of Legends, another metric that for a lot of people has been placed under scrutiny for being either way too broken or way too useless. As usual, I'll be starting first by explaining the mechanic in as much detail as necessary, then talk about how it's evolved over the years, then look at both sides of the story, listing all the pros I can think of that defend the presence of shielding before going through all the cons that denounce shielding as a negative presence in the game, with my final conclusions at the end. Healing and shielding often fit under the same wing for having more or less the same end goal, to augment a champion's health. Despite that, they're actually vastly different in a lot of circumstances, right down to the properties in which they're applied. For healing, you have things like regeneration, lifesteal, or just flat eye healing. The taxonomy doesn't go that much further, but it does for shielding. In League of Legends, shields are an addition of hit points that absorb damage in place of your actual health, but all calculations involving damage are quantified as if it was your own health. Shields can either absorb all types of damage, which consists of most shields, or they may only exclusively block either physical or magic damage. While there's a number of magic damage shields, such as Kassadin's Null Sphere, Morgana's Black Shield, or Hex Drinker, Camille has, to my knowledge, the only instance of a physical damage shield. Either way, the properties are the same. Aside from the type of damage they absorb, there are passive shields and active shields. Passives would be sort of the shield equivalent of health regeneration, where champions would get one just by existing or through a natural part of their gameplay. A good example of this would be any champion who gains a shield from their passive. Camille, Malphite, Shen, Vi, Yasuo, Rakan, it's usually super easy to acquire those shields, which is why they tend to either not last very long or block that much health. On the other hand, we have active shields, those that you can obtain through the usage of an ability, and it also comprises the majority of shields in the game. Unlike passive shields, active ones always come with a secondary effect on top of them. We can use the various enchanters to show you what I mean. Karma's Inspire and Defiance grant their target a surge of movement speed. Lulu's Help Picks attach picks onto his target, which technically qualifies as a buff. Tarek's Bastion boosts his tethered ally's armor. Sona's Aria of Perseverance is a heal and a shield. Seraphine's Surround Sound is a movement speed boost and a redemption type heal when empowered. Janna's Eye of the Storm grants the target bonus attack damage, and Ivern's Trigger Seed explodes. Even if the person gaining the shield doesn't get the bonus effect, there's still one attached to it. Thresh's Dark Passive is a plain shield, but clicking on the lantern lets you dash towards him, whereas Rakan's Battle Dance lets him dash to his allies. Finally, we have Conditional Shields, which are an extension of both passive and active shields in that they can only be given when a certain condition is met. Set and Tom Kench's shields are both dependent on how much damage they recently took. Poppy, Volibear, and Echo have shielding abilities that require them to stand in an area to pick something up. In light of being locked behind some kind of stipulation, these shields are usually the largest in size. Mordekaiser's Indestructible can amount for 30% of his maximum health, Poppy's Iron Ambassador covers 20%, Set's Haymaker can be as large as half of his total health bar, Echo's Parallel Convergence has a ridiculous 150% AP scaling, so on and so forth. You might be asking me why I'm explaining that the floor is made of floor, considering I'm sure most of you know this already. The reason is that it pertains very heavily to the discussion topic at hand, since some of the points I make either defending or attacking shields may not apply to all of them because there's so many different types. While shields haven't proliferated throughout new champions as much as healing or mobility has, there's arguably more instances of people being frustrated with shields than healing, largely in how much value they bring especially right away. So even though every new champion doesn't have a shield, those that do might get too much of a combat advantage from them. But Chimes suggested it to me yesterday that there's also an additional discussion topic I might want to layer in on top of the pros and cons. So let's start by defending the presence of shields, then move on to denouncing it, and then the third discussion part at the end. By far the most obvious point in favor of shields is that they're inherently balanced by their limited duration of effect. For all their defensive qualities, they can only mitigate damage while active and disappear after a short time, regardless of if they're destroyed or not. Balancing shields are a lot easier to do than healing because the only points in the game where they can actually be used are in combat, you know, outside of their secondary effects. This has been a sore spot for healing, and it's one of the reasons a lot of recent champions only sustain off champions. For instance, Gwen's Thousand Cuts passive only heals off of the bonus damage from champions, reason being is due to healing affecting a champion permanently. So as long as they're not being attacked, you can slowly restore your health. You ever wonder why Soraka's rush Warmogs and Aram? It's because she effectively becomes a health battery for your team since she will always be regenerating. Few shields last indefinitely, the only three that come to mind are Yumi, Rakan, and Malphite's passives. Makes sense for them to be that way if you count for their weak laning phase. Other than that, shields are usually considered to be the better health affecting mechanic of the two since their usage is only or at least mostly meant for combat and not during the neutral game. 
for lack of a better term, they're the more skill expressive element. Moreover, most ally casted shields are locked exclusively to enchanters. Any non-enchanter with a shield that can be used on allies are either much weaker in strength on a higher cooldown or do not scale very well if at all. Those with strong self-casted shields usually require paying a significant cost, such as Set and Tom Kench, or don't work on demand like Echo and Poppy. Essentially, there aren't that many shields in the game that are both super easy to use and block a lot of damage. It's also important to consider which champions have access to them. The majority of shield champions belong to either the tank, fighter, or controller class, seeing as how the first two are literally designed to soak up as much damage as possible, and controllers are, as I've explained earlier, designed to be protective supports, that's the whole purpose in life. So unlike healing, which seems to crawl its way into a bunch of champions that quite honestly shouldn't have it at all, almost every shield user is justified by way of their class's duties. One might make the counter-argument that shields can become problematic when acquired externally, such as when Ivern and Lulu stack their shields on Kogma and he becomes impossible to kill. That's a valid point, but also remember that there are very few multi-targeted shields, and the ones that exist are much weaker in strength. Sona's Aria of Perseverance can affect all five members of her team, including herself, but the shield strength only has a base value of 125 with a 30% AP scaling. Other shields like Ivern's Trigger Seed may be much stronger in base numbers and scaling, but can only affect one person at a time, so there is an element of skill involved in knowing who needs it the most at what moment. As for non-ability shields, aside from Mountain Soul, there are no external sources of shielding provided for free. Overheal Mastery is usually disregarded in favor of Triumph, and item-provided shields are low in value and locked to specific classes that would usually have to sacrifice damage or something else to gain that privilege. Seraph's Embrace was considered broken back in the day for this very reason. It gave mages a metric ton of ability power and mana while also granting them a massive shield. It's why Rise, Kassadin, and Anivia were so frustratingly tanky after building just Rod of Ages and Archangel Staff. Now of course, it no longer gives a shield, which is a good thing, because an item that gives ability power, mana, cooldown reduction, and a defensive stat was, for all intents and purposes, overpowered. So now that we've touched on the positive elements of shields, let's go through the negative ones before wrapping it up with the extra discussion. Unlike healing, which has multiple sources of grievous wounds, there was no way to mitigate enemy shields prior to the release of Serpent's Fang. Certain champions had shield breakers like Renekton's Empowered W or Blitzcrank Ultimate, but those are two champions out of over 150. Serpent's Fang is an item that's also exclusive to mostly assassins and skirmishers, rightfully so. Their core playstyle entails a lot of burst damage, which therefore makes them the two subclasses countered most by shields. But the problem with shields is that even though they're only temporary, that's only really a valid statement in the neutral game, such as if you're dancing back and forth, poking each other with whatever ranged attacks you have. During fights and skirmishes where people can die in the span of 1-2 to two seconds, Shields may as well be full heals if you take into account most of them lasting between 2 to 4 seconds. Tanks, fighters, mages, and non-lethality marksmen have no other way to deal with a Mordekaiser stopping towards them with a 1500 HP shield or a set with a 2500 HP shield. Part of why damage has become so rampant over time is due in part to shielding becoming as strong as it has. When you have someone like Riven's E giving herself a 205 plus 100% bonus AD shield every 3 seconds, it artificially raises her durability. Riven is supposed to be this high-risk, high-reward rushdown carry, but she can withstand ridiculous amounts of damage over the course of a fight if her opponents don't have the burst to nuke her down from the start. Technically speaking, Set's Haymaker is reasonable in giving him that much of a shield. It does add a level of depth to fighting against him because you either have to slowly chip him down so he can't get a big enough shield, or destroy him so thoroughly that he'll never get a chance to activate it. But if you miscalculate the amount of damage she can take, you're gonna take a heavy punish. Most conditional shields are fair to give that much because it's not easy to get them. But for champions like Yona, Rumble, Riven, Kaisa, and Diana who get big shields with the simple press of a button, that might be grounds for evaluation. They have an inherent advantage over champions that rely on heals to survive since you can't mitigate their shield value without Serpent's Fang, and how many champions can comfortably fit that into their builds. Shielding also scales drastically better than healing, for just about everyone. The only champion I can think of whose shield doesn't improve in strength is Lee Sin's Safeguard since he has to build AP to scale it, and naturally he doesn't want to do that. Once champions get their hands on some items or heal and shield power sources, their shielding can start to outpace a lot of champions' DPS. 
I'm sure we've all encountered a situation in bot lane where you were completely trashing your opponent. You got first tower and a few kills, and you're ready to start typing an early GG bot gap only for the enemy Karma, Lulu, or Sona to start turbo shielding everyone in the mid game, and all of a sudden you can't kill anyone on the enemy team. That happens a lot, it's specifically why enchanters are the strongest support class in the late game, because at a certain point they can shield their allies more than you're physically capable of inflicting damage. Non-enchanter shields may not scale nearly as exponentially since they don't buy heal and shield power items, but it's still pretty insane. As an example, Yone's Spirit Cleave at max level has a base shield of 60 plus 60% of his bonus AD. At late game or close to full build he has usually about 300 bonus AD, which means his base shield is 240, but it doubles if it strikes a champion plus 50% more for each subsequent one. So if you nail the entire enemy team, we're talking a 720 HP shield on a 6 second cooldown. Even if you only hit one champion, you're still getting close to about 500. And remember, these shields get stronger by building damage. They scale off of attack damage or ability power, not armor, health, or magic resist. You ever see late game Rumble? His empowered scrap shield can give him almost 1000 HP every 4 seconds or so at full build. So even though a lot of champions have lifesteal or omnivamp these days, you can usually overwhelm them with burst or DPS. It's rare for champions to outsustain all in damage because it's usually a gradual restoration, not immediate heals. When it comes to humongous healing, the only exceptions that come to mind are Olaf and Aatrox with their Gore Drinkers energy, but that's their whole shtick, they're Drain Tankers. Okay, so aside from the final verdict, I want to touch on something that Chime suggested to me the day before I started working on this script. Should shielding replace healing going forward? As in, unless the champion's gameplay intentionally revolves around health, such as Dr. Mundo, should any and all lifesteal or regeneration be removed from champions in place of a shield? That's an interesting thought. We've established that shields aren't as free as healing is, and it does get pretty annoying when nowadays most people can heal up any damage they take, and that's part of the reason why everyone is so bursty too. But in the COD section of this argument, I did touch on how it's a lot harder to mitigate shields in this game, and some shields block way too much damage. I think the reason Riot has a preference for heals over shields is because Grievous Wounds became a lot more standardized. Now there's one for fighters, for tanks, for mages, and supports, along with their component versions. If shielding were to suddenly become the more prevalent mechanic, I'd imagine we'd run into the same problem as we are with healing, so it's one of those catch-22s. Anyway, just like healing, I think it largely depends on the context. Certain champions like Rumble, Riven, and Yone get too large of a shield for how easy it is to acquire it. But on the other hand, we have Poppy, Volibear, and Echo who have interesting shield mechanics. And of course, enchanters are known mostly for their defensive tools, so it's a little tougher to figure them out. If you nerf the shields too much, they become worthless, and if you buff the shields, they become overpowered. It's a very delicate fine line to walk. This might sound like a terrible idea, but I wonder what would happen if we made it so every shield decayed. The most annoying shields are the ones that don't decay, so it might be worth taking into consideration. If every shield decayed quickly after casting, that would mean players would have to time them just before they're about to take a huge amount of damage, rather than whenever they're off cooldown. Even shields that only last a second and a half, like Riven and Yones, are a bit too forgiving, considering being CC'd for 1.5 seconds is a long time. We could make it so shields start decaying half a second after being used, so you have only half a second for maximum shielding. It's still enough time to block a crazy amount of damage, but short enough to where you have to be a little more precise with when you use it. Again, it might probably just be an idea that sounds good on paper, but bad on practice. I just thought it for discussion. That's it for today though. If you enjoyed the video, a rating would be much appreciated. Subscribe to the channel if you want to watch more content like this. Don't forget to follow me on my socials and join my Discord server. And lastly, check out my other mechanic discussion videos if you haven't yet. But for now, thanks all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for the next one. Take care.